Hello, my name is Enrique Chumak. I am from Faculty of Physics, University of Vienna. And this is a kind of experimental video. We are trying to see if it makes sense to make a YouTube as a platform to promote all scientific results. And uh, I was preparing an online presentation for MMM conference, which will be in November this year. And then I have realized that in reality, if I want really to say everything I would like to, I need at least two or three times more time. And that's how this video was recorded. So this video is named Nanomagnonics Progress Report. So what is magnonics? Magnonics is a new field of science in which people are trying to use spin waves, so magnetic excitations in magnetic media, and their quantum magnons to process data. And what we were doing over the last around five years, we were searching for new ways how to process data. We were searching for proper physical phenomena, which will give us possibility to do that. And we were trying to miniaturize everything because classically magnonics was established on millimeter scale, to speak about lateral sizes, then it was established on micron scale, and now principally that what we name nanomagnonics, it's when scale lateral sizes of your devices are coming closer to 100 nanometers. And um, when you do this, you will get many advantages, and this is what this talk is about. But let me first present you our team. We are a very young team, one year old group, a baby one. And uh, but we are still very happy that many talented, young, enthusiastic people joined the, uh, the group, and all of them are in Vienna, except uh, Michael Schneider and Bjorn Heinz, who are PhD students in Kaiserslautern and finalizing their study under kind of remote uh, supervision. And today I will focus on the results obtained primarily by Bjorn and by. Dr. Chi Wang, who is a postdoctoral researcher in our group. Also, a few words about external collaborators. So, first of all, it's Philip Piro, who is assistant professor at the two Kaiserslautern. Principally, everything what I will present you today we did together, but now formally he is external person. I would like to acknowledge contribution from Roman Verbach, who is a great uh, theoretician who stand behind old analytical theories which you will see today. All samples were made of uh, yik uh, grown by Karsten Dubs in Innovent in Vienna. And you know we were moving more and more in the direction of application of data processing and at some point we have realized that we cannot move on because we do not have a proper understanding what are the problems staying behind CMOS, behind CMOS, what are the challenges uh, where SpinWave can contribute and, um, you know, this side. And this was really great that we joined our efforts with people working in IMAC, Florian Tributaro and Christoph Adelman, and also with Soren Kotofana from Two Delft. So this talk is about data processing. So it means I should start with CMOS complementary metal oxide semiconductor te technology. And uh, uh, CMOS is great. However, we see here and there some signatures, some kind of hints that maybe it's not so perfect uh, everything because for example, clock rate of our devices doesn't change already for 15 years, I think. Uh, miniaturization also, it's still going on, but it's slowed down. Uh, this approach is putting more and more cores into processor instead of developing and improving processor itself also is such an issue and a question to me personally. And nevertheless, if you will analyze CMOS, it's still developing, it's still best of the best techniques. And if in past I was writing here beyond CMOS, technology is required, now I make it not so strong statement. I just say that CMOS is also not perfect. And if there is a, a, some future technology which will replace CMOS, probably it will be hybrid technology and CMOS will be combined with Samsung. We will come back to this point at the end of my presentation, but now let me just say, so what this Samsung can be, what can be combined with CMOS? And what, there are of course many different ways. 
and what we are doing so is so-called wave-based computing. So the idea is very simple that in electronics you use uh, density of charge, so electric current, to which is kind of scalar variable to carry and process data. And the idea is very simple. Let us replace the scalar variable with a wave which has amplitude, like density of electrons here, but it also has a phase. And immediately this phase gives you access to simplest interference can help you to decrease number of uh, data processing units up to 10 times in some cases. Uh, besides, a wave can be nonlinear, and this nonlinearity will be coming to it, this point today again and again. It's very important for data processing. And if you want to stick now to wave based data processing, the question is which wave to choose. And I would say that spin wave and its quantum magnon is a, a wave of choice because of a few reasons. First of all, uh, the minimal wavelengths which scales your uh, uh, element is limited by the lightest constant of your magnetic material. So principally, fundamental limitations in uh, miniaturization for magnonics are the same as for CMOS, which is good. But, uh, good. but then uh, you will have on top additional degrees, uh, advantages. Moreover, uh, if you will do downscale in wavelengths to nanometer, then or answer then you will immediately appear in the terahertz frequency range. That means that you can think about very fast data processing. Uh, and finally, spin wave is very, very nonlinear. So, and if you will see, it's very good for data processing. Okay, how people are trying to build a, so let's name it magnet computer. Uh, there are many different ways. There are un uh, many approaches for unconventional computing. People are using approaches like Fourier logic, thinking about neuromorphics, and so on and so on. Uh, but now I would like to focus on to um, uh, explicitly binary data. So that's what we name digital data, which we use in everyday life. And here I would define two main streams. So the first one we name it converter based. It was uh, originally proposed by Alexander Hitun who said that you can build computer, but you need to do two things principally. One is that you need to code your information into spin wave phase, not spin wave amplitude. And second, you need to have very good converter between electric signals. So here, imagine you have CMOS chip, then you put contacts up, and on top you put magnetic nanostructure. So you just need to convert from electric signal into magnonic, and then it propagates and you read it out and give signal information back down to uh, to CMOS. And uh, why it's good? For example, you want to build inverter. Inverter is, if I remember right, you need two transistors. And um, in this case, you can get it more or less for free because the length of your element should be simply equal to half of wavelength of spin wave. Since you are coding data into phase, obviously the signal at the output will be inverted and you have it very easily realized. Or another approach is so-called majority gate when you have three inputs, A, B, C, one output, that we also made several work in the direction of majority gate, but they are not uh, presented today. But majority gate seems to be a very powerful device. It can substitute, depending on how you count, up to 10 transistors. And of course, it's of interest. And for example, this paper, uh, it was done in IMAC, and it's a theoretical paper, numerical. They have estimated how good the spin wave device can be compared to 10 nanometer CMOS in terms of area delay power product, kind of in total, how good it is. and um, they came to conclusion that it can be up to 100 times better, which is, of course, very encouraging. We also can find several publications done by Intel in this direction. Nevertheless, this approach has only one problem, is that is named the efficiency of conversions. So principally, I think this is the main problem of our field of magnonics. We need to find a way to have very efficient excitation, very efficient detection of spin wave, Ideally, I don't know, more than 90%, because if you want to have millions such chips on your device, then of course, uh, uh, losses are very important. And uh, this, it was predicted theoretically that these converters can have re required efficiency 
but to the best of my knowledge it's not yet realized uh, or at least not yet reported but i also know that many groups are going intensively in this direction therefore just let us wait and see but there is another approach so-called all magnon approach uh, how we were thinking about it so this way with converters it's clear but if you will think about what is needed for uh, processing data in total, in general, uh, you need nonlinearity. And this nonlinearity for your processor gives you this S, which stays for semiconductor. So particularly because you use semiconductor, you can build your computer. If you could do it in a linear system, your computer would be made out of copper. And uh, it's not the case. But then we started to think, okay, we need nonlinearity, but Spin waves are always nonlinear. Yeah? So we know that Landau Lifshitz Gilbert equation is nonlinear. Everybody who performs some experiment know when you apply micro signal knows that as soon as you will apply be too much power, you will get a bunch of different modes and a lot of interest in physics in there because system is, is extremely nonlinear. And then we started to think, okay, if you have need nonlinearity and if we are already nonlinear in any magnetic material. Yeah? We don't need any special semiconductor or something because we are already there. And then why not to try to build a pro uh, such approach when one magnon controls another magnon and then principally you can build the whole computer. Idea is that of course, first time, in the first element, you need to code data from electron electric signal into magnon signal, but then you try to process it as much as possible with a magnonic system and at some point you read it out back to electric signal. And uh, of course, then in this case, the efficiency of conversions is not so important because you don't do it so many times. And that was the idea behind Magnon transistor. So its operational principle is somewhat similar to this n-channel junction FET. Uh, you see, if you apply here negative polarity to this PN junction, you create depletion zone without charge carriers, you increase resistance of this transistor or you can apply a larger voltage then you can more or less close it and in our case it looks like this we also have source gate drain regions you inject blue magnets into source they propagate towards drain but then you can inject red magnets into the gate and they will be scattered that only some magnets will reach the drain or you can close it completely and uh, it's appeared to be so it was shown all experimentally that this effect is very efficient that you can control large number of blue magnets with small number of red magnets in a way that your input signal, red signal here, can be much smaller than the output signal drain. And this gives you a possibility to, to use it for amplification. And because we can theoretically use it for amplification, we've got uh, access to this by the word transistors. Uh, otherwise, it would be just a ventil. But on another hand side, particularly for data processing, we really just needed a ventil but we wanted to close the flow of magnet, not with electric signal, or like it's easy to do. We wanted to use particularly other magnets that this output signal can be considered as input signal for the next device so that we can do cas cascading. And as I said, it was shown experimentally. This was prototype, so like lens eight millimeter or so. Uh, we excited 50 nanosecond a long pulse packet, it took 300 nanoseconds and it reaches the drain, and then we could detect it some pulse without any red magnets. Then I started to apply some uh, micro signal to inject red magnets and we got really efficient suppression on off rate was three orders of magnitude. And um, uh, the physics behind is four magnets scattering when two magnets, one is here, this is blue magnet where it's sitting in the dispersion curves, and red magnets, it was a standing wave in between break mirrors. So principally it's over here. And then they were scattered and generated some high key magnets. But uh, so it was not very efficient approach, but the most important is that it has shown that it is possible in principle about uh, to think about all magnon circuits when all information is processed purely within magnon system. And before I will show you to what state we came on the way of all magnet data processing, let me present you the material we are working with. 
So today I will focus exclusively on yttrium iron garnet. It's kind of noble magnetic material because spin waves live in them around 100 times longer than in metals, in other magnetic materials. And the reason behind is there are two reasons. So first of all, this iron 3 plus iron has a zero orbital angular momentum. As a result, spin orbit interaction is suppressed. And second, it's an insulator. So there are no free electrons and, and damping associated with them. That's why spin waves can live up to hundreds of nanoseconds. And this is very important because you want to carry your information over a long distance. Uh, at the same time, it's a ferry magnet. So two uh, ions of iron 3 plus are partially compensated by three ions uh, 3 plus from another sub lattice. And uh, it means the saturation magnetization is small. So it's ferry magnet. And um, people who work with spin waves know that uh, for dipolar waves, which we mainly work nowadays, Velocity of spin waves is proportional to saturation magnetization, to MS. So it means that in classical geek, spin waves are long living but not very fast. However, it's obvious now, and this is topic of this special session, please uh, see the talks of my colleagues, uh, that we want to have this waves, uh, that we want to switch now from dipolar to exchange dominated waves because they are fast and better, but in have much shorter wavelengths, which is also good for miniaturization. And these waves have velocity, which is inversely proportional to MS. And that means that um, spin wave in nano geek, uh, a change spin wave will be long living and fast and kind of will be double advantage. That's why we are interested in this particular material. Okay, and here is the outline of my talk. So I split my, the presentation into three main blocks. The first one, I want to speak about magnonic nanostructures and uh, magnonic waveguides. So nowadays we can go down to 50 nanometer wide waveguides. It's not seven nanometer in CMOS, but it's already in the same order of magnitude. And um, in the second block, I will show you how we can use these nanostructures to process data, an example of directional coupler. Moreover, I will show you first integrated magnetic circuit uh, or based uh, so an example of half adder, uh, but these are simulations. And at the end of the talk, I would like to speak a bit uh, more about where are we now with respect to CMOS and what is waiting for this research direction. So, what about nanostructures? As I said, I will focus today on yttrium iron garnet. And yttrium iron garnet classically is growing using liquid phase epitaxy in with the thicknesses in micrometer range. So for example, magnet transistors was made from five micron thick gig. And then spin wave can run millimeters to centimeters. So it means the structures are macroscopic. Uh, so 10, 20 years ago, is uh, so-called micron scale magnonics was established primarily with uh, permaloy. Uh, for example, Vlad Dimido from Münster did really many pioneer works in that direction. And at some point, I think 2014, we and our partners from, so our uh, friendly competitors from France and uh, uh, Spain, they, we all both practically simultaneously reported on the structures with micrometer sizes. In our case, it was two or five micron, and they reported on disks down to 300 nanometers, I think. And um, uh, so it became possible because over the last years, people learned how to grow nanometer thick yttrium iron garnet. So instead of micron, thickness can be 100 nanometers or less. Nowadays it's 10 nanometers, not a problem anymore. And of course it allows you to shrink the structure down in the lateral dimension also. What do we do now? So first of all, as I said, we are very happy that we have joint project with Karsten Dupes and we have access to his fantastic yttrium iron garnet which is, so he took this classical technology for liquid phase epitaxy geek and he modified it in a way that he can grow um, structures down to 10 nanometer thickness with quite good quality. And he sends the samples to us and then Bjorn Heinz takes this sample and goes to clean room or he, to in, in Kaiserslautern and he does the following. So this is geek. It's growing on uh, gallium-gadolinium garnet substrate. 
and then he put two layers of PPMA, eBeam lithography development, and he spot, uh, spotters double metal chromium titanium has shown the best result. And why do we need that? Because afterwards we want to use argon etching, dry etching, but yik is very hard material, so you need very hard mask in order that it's not etched away earlier than yik. Therefore, we use this mask. So after uh, lift off and so on, we have a metal mask. We do iron etching. We remove chromium etchant, and we have a nice uh, freestanding yik structure, nano structure on top of GGG. And here is the results of the smaller structure, such waveguide. You see that it has trapezoidal shape. And this size at the bottom is around uh, 30 nanometers, and this size is at the edges, it's around 20 nanometers. So uh, in our papers, we speak, we just kind of take the average of this width and we speak about 50 nanometer wide waveguide. Okay, so we do have the structures. Now the question was, of course, to measure it. And as a first step, we did it very simple. This is our GGG on which they were made different stripes of different or nanostructures of different widths. And then we just place them onto FMR antenna, standard broad antenna that we place everything into uniform excitation field and we excite magnetization precession in them. And uh, we can sweep frequency with very small, uh, with very high resolution. But uh, afterwards we focus our laser beam on top and we analyze scattered light using brilliant light scattering spectroscopy. And you know that BLS has very bad frequency resolution, maybe 200, 300 megahertz, which would be not very nice. But if you do it in a smart way that you use BLS not to get resolution, you just measure amplitude, and then you apply f frequency with very small step, which can be smaller than megahertz, then principally it's more or less reproduces you FMR, but uh, very especially localized. So now you can measure a single nanoparticle. I think this approach was originally, uh, Dimit, uh, Vlad Dimido started to use it originally, and it's really a nice way. And that's what we did. We just started to see our excitation frequency, and we see that for one micron, we have here a nice peak at around five gigahertz. And then we go to the smaller structures, 50 nanometer, and we see it peaks at around 5.3, 5.4 which is good, but afterwards we started to calculate where it should be. And our theory said that this frequency should be 11 gigahertz or so. Of course, it means that we do not really understand what is going on in these nanostructures. It took some time and work and efforts, but all answers you can find in this PRL. Please also check uh, supplementary materials. We had to put a lot of original important information also there. And uh, the reason behind this disagreement is very simple. It's so-called dipolar pinning. People who are working with micron-scaled magnonics, they know that there is such effect of dipolar pinning. When the, this is a width of waveguide, and this is the amplitude of magnetization precession, and you see that in the middle, precession angle is larger, and at the edge, there is practically no precession. So for one micron, it's partially pinned, so we say is that these pins are pinned, but if you would have here two five micron, it would be fully pinned. And uh, uh, this happens simply because a system is trying to minimize its uh, uh, dipolar energy. So it was trying to minimize stray field outside of the sample and gets it pinned. Uh, so this is something known. And when we started to calculate the dispersion, we just took standard approach like we always do, a fully pinned case and were surprised. Uh, studies have shown us that when you decrease the width of the waveguide, at some point, this dipolar pinning phenomena gets into competition with exchange interaction. And exchange, as we all know, wants to keep your spins parallel. Moreover, exchange is much, much more stronger uh, than uh, dipolar interactions. Therefore, when you make your waveguide smaller and smaller and smaller, at some point, exchange tells you, no, guys no more pinning and keeps all spins parallel like it's shown here and your mode is getting then uniform so you see such a nice mode uh, at which width it happens it depends of course on materials since it's an interplay between dipolar and exchange interaction 
like in domain walls. Uh, it all depends on material and on the thickness of your uh, sample. For YIG, if it's 50 to 100 nanometer thick, I would say the threshold happens when you go below three, 400 nanometers in width. Yeah, so when you have larger structures, you work in kind of in micron magnonic, micro scale magnonic. If you go to smaller structures, it's getting unpinned. And principally, this mode in many cases, it's really great to work with such uniform nice mode without uh, problems with edges and so on. And next question, okay, what we can tell about spin wave dispersions? So here is this simulated dispersion for 5 micron wide waveguide and for 200 nanometer wide waveguide. Imagine that you work with this waveguide and you want to work at frequency 2.5 gigahertz. That means here. What you really want to have, you want to excite spin wave in this lowest mode and work only with this mode. Yeah? But what happens in reality is that as soon as you have some non-uniformity, as soon as you want to bend your waveguide or to do anything else, Due to elastic two magnet scattering, all spin wave modes at the same frequency will be populated. And if you will look on these publications on microscale magnonics over the last 20 years, you will see it practically everywhere. People either investigate this phenomenon or searching for a way how to get rid of it. And but for data processing, it's catastrophic. You lose information. Instead of having nice wave with a strictly defined phase, you always have a bunch of different waves with different phases, different wavelengths, and it's really a painful. And what happens if you go down to 200 nanometer, for example? And then what happens? We still have quantization. So here you see second or third width mode. And if you have quantization over width, you still have exchange interaction. And exchange interaction simply shifts your frequency up. It means that if you work not with micron magnonics, but with nanomagnonics, you can operate nicely with one mode. And uh, this is a great advantage of nanoscale. And again, threshold happens. It's very similar values to the unpinning phenomena. Again, you need to be below three, four hundred nanometers if it's ethereum iron garnet. Uh, so it means that we can work with single mode waveguides, which is a very important issue, particularly for data processing. How about dispersion? So here you see this dashed line. These are analytical lines, quite semi-analytical. And here you see the frequency of spin wave for this point for FMR of k equals zero point as a function of waveguide width from one micron down to 50 nanometers. And this point is experiment, that's what we have measured. And as I said at the very beginning, we just took classical theory of Kalinikoslavin, considered just pin spin, the simplest case, and we have got that there should be such behavior of frequencies. That's why we expected 11 gigahertz. When we see that something is wrong, we started to go deeper and we found paper Guslienka Slavin Hillebrands. So we named the theory internally just Guslienka theory, where they took into account um, pinning properly. And it's better, this red curve, but it's not yet um, what we need. And the reason is very good, uh, simple. They uh, came to the their final answer is analytical. So it means that they had to use some simplifications in their model. And simplifications means that uh, it also, it doesn't work for all cases. Yeah, so it, something should not work. And in their particular case, uh, this uh, theory doesn't work when the width of your structure is getting comparable to thickness. Uh, so it's assumption that it works only for very large widths. That's why it doesn't describe situation here. And then it was a great luck that Roman Verba agreed to help us. And he just took all the theories. He introduced in there additional demagnetization tenders that now you take into account real shape. And moreover, he said that uh, at which point you have to stop. So when you have analytical formula, you simplify, simplify. But starting from some point, you should really use already a computer because system is complicated. You need to plug in all these uh, formulas. That's why this theory is semi-analytic. Uh, but uh, the good point is that it describes everything perfect. Uh, experiment and numerical simulation. So you see these dispersion curves agrees ideally. 
and also this green line describes experiments so principally this is a theoretical model with which we are working on constantly to understand what is a spin wave dispersion in a nanostructure yeah all the theory you can find in this paper but how about propagating wave and can we prove that this is really single mode wave guide and this result was published recently in this nano letter it's a very nice journal they, they published it so fast i was just really great pleasure to work with them uh, i should tell you that unfortunately in this paper we do not use word single mode wave guide it's kind of silly but approximately the moment when this paper was published we have realized that this was the first single mode wave guide which is for example in photonics it's very big issue yeah, to have this single mode wave guides uh, but yeah i just tell you and um, i uh, i have principally this is already the proof yeah because in that paper we are scaling down to 50 nanometer wave guide and the uh, threshold as i said three four hundred nanometers the smaller the bit the higher all this uh, higher modes in frequency So how the experiment was performed? What Bjorn did, he just made many waveguides here of different widths down to 50 nanometer. Then he placed such a rather large micron scale antenna uh, to excite spin waves, dipolar spin waves with rather large wavelengths to micron or something. And um, the smallest waveguide, as I said, is this one. So 50 nanometer on average. This is antenna to excite spin waves and he studies them again using microfocus brilliant light scattering spectroscopy uh, where he can get time evolution frequency resolution and it's time special results so he can get also to the intensity map here are all the parameters so i will skip all this he did really a huge amount of study systematization and so on and uh, but i will just focus on the very uh, main achievement so if you measure spin wave propagation in one micron wide waveguide what you will get you can immediately get the decay lens and this decay lens was 12 micron uh, uh, the point is that here i will show you later it's a very large question how you not magnetize the structure and uh, the magnetization along waveguide like it's shown here so-called backward volume geometry has many advantages which you will see soon but uh, it has also a large disadvantage that spin wave is the slowest possible in this case but we specially chosen this the most complicated scenario and even in this case the free pass of 12 micron it's really great because it means that you can see your carry your uh, information over tens of micron you never limit it with only one decay lens uh, and for the slowest wave so principally it was quite good uh, very good result it's much better than in um, metals or something permanent uh, but uh, if you go down to other smaller bits 15 nanometers what happens in this case is that uh, the key lens drops down to 1.8 micron. Why is that? The reason is simply uh, the, the narrower you make your waveguide, the more flat will be your dispersion in dipolar region. So if you will go to very short wavelengths, exchange wavelengths, then you don't care. It will be always fast for large, for small, for any width. But if you work to in dipolar region like here, the smaller widths the slower the wave, uh, the wave, yeah. That means that uh, simply because of velocity, our decay lens drop down to two micron, which is still not bad, definitely. But let us have a look on um, the decay lens for different structures. This is a bit of structure, so each black point here means new sample. So we are really did a lot of work. And this red curve, it's, uh, theoretical estimation based on the parameters obtained from ferromagnetic resonance. So before we make structure, we of course put our unstructured film onto fMR, we get alpha average and what we need, and then we use these parameters. So if you will compare red to black, you see that for large structures, experiment is even better than was expected from uh, theory. And the reason is probably in the uniformity of the film. The point is that fMR measures everything and then we define parameters 
but when you make structure in one particular part, probably this structure is more uniform there. That's why uh, decay length is even better than expected. Then when you move down in the width, you see that starting from some point, the quality, so probably the structure damages heat, and the experiment starts showing worse uh, free paths compared to experiment. And then it goes here. And the most very interesting also is that as the very smaller structures we measured, 50 and 80, I think, nanometer, uh, then we have the situation when Experiment is again better than uh, theory. And uh, this can be signature. It was very surprising, approximately two times better. It was surprising because uh, uh, there should be no such fast spin wave in that case. And this is probably the, the direct signature that in this particular case, we also see magnet transport not by dipolar waves, but also due to, by exchange waves, which are faster, which exist at the same frequency, but for much smaller wavelengths. And these wavelengths are excited probably due to simply two magnet scattering when we indirectly excite them. And then with BLS, we see them also. But the main message is that this is definitely single mode waveguide. It's perfect for data processing and SpinWave really carries information at least as much as it's necessary and even longer than we, it was predicted. But how about Damon Ashbach geometry? So as I said, this configuration is, uh, has advantages, but the disadvantage is that velocity is slow, it means free pass is slow. Therefore, what it, this is on, only one slide with completely original results. This are just a preliminary study. Bern is measuring right now, and what he did, he turned field perpendicular. Uh, of course, it's not so simple. You need contacts and so on and so on, but uh, he planned all this. And why we did it is because the Eschbach mode in this configuration is much faster. Yeah? And most of the paper, in most of the papers, people use the Eschbach. But what you expect in this uh, case, you expect troubles with demagnetization because your structure is now very small. And if uh, it was well studied in micro scale magnonics for permalloy, for example, and also for YIC was shown that if you magnetize the structure perpendicularly, then you have very non-uniform field inside of the waveguide. But usually you have situations that there is a quite broad region in the middle with flats waveguide and there you can excite the uh, main mode and at the edges there is a drop down and then it was shown that here you can excite so-called edge modes and the frequency is smaller than main one and uh, but this is if you the width of your waveguide let's say two three micron but if you go to 50 nanometers you have no anymore any flat region and you see that if you apply 16 millitesla and the field in the middle will be less than 250 and it will be all non-uniform kind of edge mode. Therefore, it was a question if something will propagate at all and how, but uh, honestly, we know spin wave already and we were very sure that it will propagate and we were sure that it will propagate longer than for backward volume geometry. Uh, but what we did not expect that it will propagate so good because as you can see here, so this is the K lens, it all depends on frequency because of uh, dispersion curve and velocity in different points. So this is preliminary measurements from Bjorn. But you see that principally, SpinWeb has free pass from 10 to 18 uh, nanometer. These are slow dipolar waves, so still in dipolar region. And uh, it's a bit too much. I would say we didn't expect the SpinWeb to run so fast and so far away. Uh, so it's all under in, um, investigations. I hope at the future conferences we'll be able to show you, to explain why it happens. But at the moment, just keep in mind that uh, for backward volume geometry, the propagation passes around 1.8 micron up to, or predicted in reality, it should be 0.9. So this is probably due to contribution from exchange phase. And here it's 10 times larger, which is very interesting. But I would like now to come to data processing. Okay, we have this nice waveguide. How do we process data with them? 
And the first what we did is a so-called directional coupler. So directional coupler, it's a device which is intensively used in uh, micro technique and probably in any laboratory uh, has this um, device. It's also intensively used in photonics and so on. Also in magnonics for spin waves, it was uh, pioneers here, uh, Alexander Sadovnikov who's working in the group of Sergei Nikitov. Uh, I show you here only their first paper, but please pay attention. They have made a, the whole series of very nice papers, linear, non-linear directional coupler and so on. And the idea is very simple. If you have two waveguides, which are placed close one to another, you excite spin wave in one waveguide, then it carries and it pumps energy to one mode, to second waveguides and back back like in two coupled oscillators which are coupled to some point all energy is in one waveguide another here and then it simply jumps so they started this uh, coupled waveguides principally it can be work as directional coupler but as you see here you rely on to the antenna so it means that if you want to make cascading you need again to you will get this trouble that you need to read out information to electric signal and then in the next time you need to code it again back and we, of course, are interested in something different. We are thinking how to build a magnet circuit. Uh, so uh, therefore, we published this as numerics purely in this pipe, paper in 2018. We took HIG, we took nanoscale, 100 nanometers, that's what we can fabricate. And uh, what we did differently, we do not use antennas. Yeah, We especially developed this waveguides where it can go like that. And um, uh, this is the next advantage of nanoscaled magnonics because, first of all, our, this waveguide is single mode, but second, if you work in backward volume geometry, you do not, you put only very weak uh, field along. And then what happens, shape and isotropy put your magnetization always along the waveguide, like it's shown here. And in this case, we're solving another big problem of uh, magnonics, it's uh, anisotropy, it's so strong uh, anisotropy of spin wave dispersion when film is magnetized in plane because this wave and this wave have completely different frequencies therefore if you want to have um, to the circuit you will get a trouble but if you use nanoscale structures where shape simply keep your magnetization along wave always run along magnetization and in such a way you can really forget about problem with uh, anisotropy there are no parasitic scattering because it's single mode waveguide and when she has shown that spin wave propagates here so like 95 percent reaches this output after one two three four con uh, turns it was impressive and because on my if you will increase sizes four times or five times you will have here 10 percent so that's really the advantage of uh, nanoscale magnonics particularly and then it, she has performed very systematic measurements, uh, simulations, so all this um, directional coupler is well explained. And so I can recommend you this paper. And moreover, Roman and Andrei Slavin have developed analytical theories, and I didn't see at least any other theory about directional coupler. All is described there. But today I would like to speak about experimental realization of this directional coupler. Uh, so this paper now uh, it's 8th of October and paper will be published on 19th so probably when you see it it's already published uh, but I just made a print screen from proof and uh, the structure was fabricated by Martin Kavenik and uh, the BLS this uh, special BLS for investigating particular nano geek uh, was developed by Michael Schneider together with Bjorn Heinz and all measurements were done by uh, Chi Wang himself and the structure looks like this this is HIG waveguide 350 nanometer wide it works the best in this case the gap was rather large 320 nanometer but still was good and then this is antenna where we apply microwave signal and we excite spin waves into this waveguide when spin waves is excited, it just runs into this waveguide. This is just standard conduit, nothing special. But starting from this point, we have here a second waveguide. So this is our directional coupler, where spin waves start speaking between. Moreover, we wanted to test this approach of self-biased waveguides. If really we can 
have guided of spin wave through two turns. So we may turn here, we may turn here and see if spin wave can also get out. Because now they do not speak to each other, so it means that this are uh, independent wave guides like here, and you can send the information to the next wave guide. And so there is of course always always large work, systematic investigations. I will show you just the final result, the most clear, because BLS it has special resolution, so we just scanned uh, BLS intense, uh, spin wave intensity in 2D, so blue means no spin wave, red means large spin wave intensity, and uh, if you apply this frequency, you excite spin wave, you see that it propagates and then it simply jumps to the next wave guide, and all outputs so of here is signal summarized within this rectangle, you see that all most of energy is sitting here, that means that our directional coupler works good. But what is good for about directional coupler is that this coupling length, so-called, it's a distance from this point to this point, so distance which spin wave propagates when it pumps its energy to another waveguide, it strongly depends on the wavelength of your spin wave. And it means on frequency. Therefore, what you can do, you can slightly tune the frequency and you can define such coupling lengths that half of energy will go to one waveguide, half of energy will go to another waveguide. So you can use it as a power splitter, 50-50%. Or you can play further with frequency, 58, and in this case, you have spin wave propagates, it jumps here, and then it even can jump back. So that's all was predicted, the theoretical and numerical unknown. Nevertheless, we were very happy that it also works so good at experiment. But the next question I would like to ask, how about nonlinearity? You remember we discussed that if you want to build computer or any other data processing unit, you need nonlinear phenomena. A good point about magnonics is that it's there are many different powerful pronounced nonlinear phenomena. So you have seen this the magnet transistor, it was four magnet scattered. We have some unpublished results where we use very efficiently three magnet scattered. But here I would like to focus on another type of nonlinear mechanism. Of course, there is a uh, uh, classification and some people would not agree with my terminology, but I would like to position this phenomenon as a different one. And the phenomenon is very simple. When you excite some large precession angle, then your saturation magnetization will be decreased. So I just formulated the decrease in the saturation magnetization with the increase in the prece magnetization precession angle. Because magnetization precession angle, it's nothing else as spin wave amplitude. It is very simple. If you have LLG, you know that length of M should be conserved. And it means that if you have very small spin wave excitation, the saturation of your magne uh, magnetic material is M0. If you keep constantly the excited spin wave with some large angle, then your effective magnetization decreases to this value and it's the same like you would change magnetization or would replace your sample. But this you can change sample by spin wave itself. This is a great advantage. Uh, principally theory, it was all described by a theory Lvov Zaharov, uh, or I, it's not always easy to understand uh, this uh, theory from the original sources, I, but I could recommend you, there's a fantastic uh, paper from Paul Krivosik from Colorado State University, who uh, who more or less described all these phenomena perfectly. We always use that paper. And if you have this decrease in MS with excitation of magnetization precession, then what happens, of course, there will be a shift in dispersion. So here you see two cases. Uh, mode for uh, blue one is when you excite spin wave with a field 2 millitesla. And you see it here, this one mode, another mode. And uh, so this is in the directional coupler when it's already split between symmetric and asymmetric mode, but I don't go into the details. What is important for us now is that when you increase excitation power two times from two to four millitesla, what happens, this dispersion, you see this red one, it shifts down. And this shift is what we need because uh, then it means that you always work at fixed frequency, like 2 to A2 in this case, but it means that wavelengths of your uh, wave changes, and it gives you a lot of advantages. For example, 
this is simple, just one experiment, but clearly explains what I mean. If you go apply zero dBm power, it works as a normal directional coupler, all energy is pumped into the next waveguide. If you increase power to 11 dB, like it's shown here, then what happens, you see that coupling length changes, so it's not this one, but it's twice smaller, and spin wave excited here, jumps here, and then goes back. So it means that you can decide if your wave propagates in one direction or in another direction, depending on its amplitude. Yeah, you do not apply external field, though. so it's really wave itself, decide where it goes. And this is very powerful mechanism, and if you will compare it with uh, another nonlinear approach in magnet transistor, this one is much better, because magnet transistor, it's nothing else, it's very efficient absorber. If you have one magnet, you send another, you create such a super overheated uh, gas of magnets where nothing is able to reach out. It's like black holes. But it means that you lose all this energy within transistor. Here, we do not absorb energy. You really just, one signal goes there or there. It never stays inside of your system. It's always outside. Therefore, from point, the point of view of data processing, this approach is much more powerful. And if to speak about what does it give us, First of all, it, what made us very happy is that nonlinear functionality works. We ex expected it, but uh, we were ha very happy that it's even more actually pronounced than we expected. And if to speak about directional coupler for what it can be used. So if it's, first of all, it can be used for RF application. In linear regime, like it was shown in previous slides, it's power splitter, it's filter, it's delay line, it's frequency divider, multiplexer, so principally, most of uh, RF applications you want to do, you can do using this device, and it's all together like few microns large, yeah? so it's very small structure. And if you want to use nonlinear effect, it also can be used as power limiter, uh, signal to noise enhancer, and there are many applications also with this nonlinear functionality. If to speak about binary data, it can work as AND, XOR logic gate, or can be used to build half adder, and this I will present to you in a minute. But also, this functionality is of large importance for unconventional computing, for example, neuromorphic. Because in neuromorphics, also nonlinearity is one of the biggest issues, and this particular realization of nonlinear element can be of interest over there. But let us focus now on binary data back. So how can we use directional coupler to build a magnet computer? Uh, what means magnet computer? Of course, as I said, there is the stage of uh, the evolution of our field is so that we have single logic data processing units already reported, like majority gate, exclusive or other elements are shown. What is not shown is an uh, integrated circuit when at least two chips are combined together, two logic elements, because this would be the first uh, integrated circuit. And uh, that was our motivation. And we started to look, okay, what to do that we can combine two logic gates. And then we came to half adder, because half adder, you can build it from XOR and end logic gate. And this is a logic device which has two inputs A and B to output sum and carry. And the maximum what it can do is one plus one equal two. But if you can combine many of them, then principally you can do any arithmetic. That's how our computer works. Therefore, we started to think about half adder, and first problem we meet is actually was this cross. Because we need to know how to pass information. In electronics, it's done in a way that, um, like it's shown here, yeah, that you, you certainly mentioned. 3D magnonics is getting now more and more attention. So Alexander Dobrovolsky in our group is uh, leading this research direction. So there are uh, many interesting approaches, but in this particular case, you can, instead of using complex structure, you can use cool physics. And uh, since this actually how we started to think about directional coupler, and we have found that Sodonic already published everything, because if you have directional coupler, you can create situations that simply in the energy will be going like this. And this is, of course, great. You don't need third dimension. It, you don't need extra few steps of uh, bibliography and so on. Everything is planar, uh, one element and so on. Therefore, this problem is sorted with directional coupler. But 
then when she started to think more and more in depth how to build uh, Hafeder, he has shown many designs. But the best one he came is uh, uh, this magnetic half header, which consists of two directional couplers. So principally having two directional coupler, you can get the whole um, uh, half header. How does it work? So information is coded into spin wave amplitude. It means if you excite amplitude, so two inputs A and B to output sum and carry, if you excite spin wave here, it's logic one. If there is no spin wave, it's logic zero. And then we are checking if here, if there is some spin wave, it's logic one. If there is no wave, it's logic zero. Then signal goes like this, and this directional coupler is tuned in a regime. We name it linear directional coupler. It works in a regime of simply power splitter. All energy which is sent here is sent 50% goes to this arm, 50% goes to this arm. The same from here. One is everything what goes here, 50% here, 50% here. This output also can work as, as exclusive or logic gate, and you can use it, or you can build here another half header if you want. But in this particular case, you just put here dumping and forget about it. Um, what is important here is the most important here is this nonlinear directional coupler. What is that? This is again the directional coupler with the difference that you see it's very long and distance between uh, two wires is small. That means that we especially want to do it in a way that uh, we have very strong coupling. Why? Because in this case, we can reach a situation when spin waves jumps back and forth many, many times. And if you apply small excitation power to millitesla to here to excite it, then what happens here show normalized output power for P1 out here, and it's normalized with the total power. So you see practically 100% of energy goes fully to this um, arm. Now, what you do, you start to increase power. And if you're coming to the situation when your power is increased two times, uh, or field is increased two times, what happens is you see that it jumps back and forth, but all energy starts going to the output wave. So exactly like you have seen, seen an experiment, but in the experiment we have changed power 10 times, a bit more than. And, uh, but for logic, it's very important to make it this effect. First of all, it's the most important is to control nonlinearity. Yeah? As I said, each non-magnetic system is completely uh, nonlinear, and, uh, but usually it just brings everything into chaos. Therefore, the first trick was to be able really to control your nonlinearity that it does proper job for you. But second task was to make it um, to get qualitative change with a very small change in amplitude. So to have it very sensitive. And this is particularly the reason why this directional coupler is so long, because when you change power on the applied magnetic field only two times, you slightly change angle of precession here, you slightly change delta M, and this you slightly shift dispersion curve. But this shift in dispersion curve introduces a small change between coupling length, so between this and this point, in coupling length, yeah? And then we need to accumulate it. That's why we have it long, that it's accumulated. And at the end of the day, small change in MS gives you qualitative difference, that all energy goes not this channel, but this channel. And understanding this nonlinear directional coupler, we can immediately switch to the uh, experimental results. So all this is numerics. Yeah? We have shown an experiment only this directional coupler that it works. This actually and this one, it's kind of in between. It can work in both cases. Uh, but uh, uh, the device itself, it's all numerics using uh, Mumax. So let us see how it works. We inject magnets only here. This red means injected, injected magnets, blue means no magnets. And you see that spin wave goes and 50% here, Dumper, 50% here, jumps back and forth, and everything goes to output S. S equal one, C equal zero, true stable is satisfied. Let us send now signal to B, A equal zero, B is equal one, again, 50%, back and forth, and exactly the same output. S equal one, zero. So zero plus one is equal one, and one plus zero is equal one. 
if you apply no signal zero and zero it's clear that here also will be zero and zero so zero zero plus zero will be zero which comes automatically in our case the most complicated part is one plus one one plus one uh, this signal is sent to the directional coupler with a phase pi over two it's done on, per on purpose because in this case all energy from both channels will be guided into this wave guy so here principally we have four times larger uh, amplitude and then it goes jumps back and forth and as it has been shown in the previous slide all energy now goes to output c not to s so we have s0 c1 and the last part of truth table of half either is satisfied so we do have that what we need and now let us look is it good or bad here we use only three um, nanowires. So you see, these are only three nanowires, which sometimes are closer, sometimes are uh, even more close, sometimes a longer distance. And that's it. Planar structure, one material, three nanowires, and uh, of course, spin wave physics. And that's how it works. If you want to do half feather in CMOS, in, at least in the simplest case, you will need 14 CMOS transistors. And 14 is a lot because you understand, even if it's 7 nanometer CMOS, it doesn't mean that you just take 7 multiply it with 14. No, it's a huge structure. Each transistor consists of many elements and you need to put all this together. You need to put all the wirings. You need to take into account delays, capacities, and so on. It works so good simply because people study it for 50 years. And in our case, it's advantage of magnonics is clearly visible because three nanowires and physics. How good it is. So I will come back to it uh, in a minute, but principally this 100 nanometer uh, uh, structure is comparable to seven nanometer CMOS in terms of energy and area, but it is slower. Uh, but what is bad about this structure is that we still need amplifier. As I said, this is principally first integrated magnetic circuit, but it's not full yet ready for the full uh, cascading with the next structures. If you will look on this case, one, one, and then here we have two, yeah, twice large amplitude, but here to the output, the amplitude of spin wave is exactly equal to this one. You see here it's equal one. It means that this output C principally can go directly to the next waveguide, to the next uh, logic element or half adder, or it can be any other logic element, whatever you want to build with your directional coupler. Um, and this is good, but, why it happens simply because although yik is so good and although we have practically no reflections here still spin wave long runs very long distance still there is some small reflections and amplitude here uh, is exactly twice smaller than amplitude here yeah, when it's combined therefore we are coming from two we are coming back to one and that's what we need but let us have a look on this output c here it's one here 50%, here 25%. So it means that this output cannot be sent to the input of next one. Non linearity, you need really to choose proper amplitude that it works, not too much, not too less. And it means that here you need to uh, put amplifier four times. So this amplitude should be con constantly amplified four times. And this is yet missing. Uh, this amplifier, and we analyze different ways what it can be used. Uh, spin transit torque uh, can be used, spin hall effect can be used, uh, but that's a question of um, efficiency and energy consumption. Uh, very well studied, the best studied uh, amplifiers nowadays, parametric amplifiers using uh, simply magnetic field, alternative magnetic field at double frequencies so parallel parametric pumping. But we have checked energy consumption is not good for this particular uh, purposes. Uh, but the good way is this work, again, Roman, you see this team, Vasil and Ray are here. They said, let us do parametrics, but instead of uh, sending current and using this Orsted field around, let us use voltage control magnetic anisotropy. And they have shown that this uh, amplifier can be very good, and it has really amazing energy consumption. I will show you uh, in the table uh, soon. And uh, moreover, there is a first experimental realization of this approach. I think it's not exactly amplifier of propagating wave, not exactly what we need, 
but nevertheless it's realized experimentally in the group of Ilya and they show that this approach should work. And now is the most interesting part. Is this all good with respect to CMOS or not? Where are we? Uh, the point is that when we made this magnum transistor, when it was millimeter large and uh, consumed nanojoule power, it was really hard to make real benchmark benchmarking because we were simply too, too far away. Now, after spending these five nice years moving into this direction, we see that we at least can make benchmark and we can understand. And this is a table which we placed into this nature electronics. And here you see the parameters for iterum and garnet, this, this simulated device. Then we made it better, we optimized it and also simulated, so it's not shown, but only parameters uh, in the table for 30 nanometer rig, and we compare it with seven nanometer CMOS. And here it's really great that uh, Sorin made the estimation what should be. So at that time when we did this job, it was future CMOS, but till the moment we published this paper, it's already on market, so seven nanometer CMOS. So which parameters do we analyze? Aria, it's easy. You have here just, you know, the structure, you know how much uh, large, uh, large footprint it needs. Here's the largest problem is, of course, length of the uh, directional coupler. You have to accumulate your nonlinearity. Delay time, also easy. You know how long it propagates. And energy consumption. We did simulations using the MUMAX. There you can check how much power you have into your structure. You know time, you can get energy consumption. And... Uh, uh, let us have a look now on this parameter. Let, let us immediately have a look on the 30 nanometer optimized yig. So area will be in this case one micron and for CMOS it's a seven nanometer CMOS but still if you want to put 14 transistor together the whole structure will take the same square micron. So we are in the same footprint. Energy consumption Energy consumption you see that all this energy which we spend here fully within magnetic system is only two attajoule. Of course, we do not forget that we need amplifier, therefore we are summarizing it as two attajoule. This would be the power energy consumption if you would use classical parametric pumping. But if you will use this VCMA parametric pumping, it will be only three attajoule. So it means the total energy consumption here will be five attajoule and CMOS 35. So it means seven times better, which is already very encouraging. And if to speak about the delay time, how much time we need, we are not very good here. So even in this one, it's 18 nanosecond. And when Soren sends this data and says that CMOS does all the job within 60 picosecond, <laughs> yeah, CMOS is fantastic technology. But at the same time, you should understand that they never use a 60 picosecond because they have problems with joule heat and you know that our clock rate is stuck at 3 gigahertz. So I would say the realistic time here is 0.3 nanosecond, which is already not so much different from our times. Is this good or bad? Let us compare these two points. I think these are two main milestones. This was beginning and this is important milestone on this way. Uh, yeah, it was all funded uh, by Brussels in the frames of this ERC. The energy consumption in the magnet transistor, you see this exp means experiment. I could simply measure it was all micro technique. And I know that I spent used to process one bit 2.5 nanojoule. It was minimal size of this element was two micron millimeter, sorry. And speed, it was 100 nanometer. Now, if you compare to half adder energy from numerics, five other joules, so we are nine orders of magnitude beta. Very, very good progress, I would say. Uh, minimal size, so here I write 350 nanometer, it's that directional coupler which we realized experimentally, but principally we also can show 50 nanometer waveguides, or seven times smaller. Therefore, factor is 10 to the power of four, 10 to the power of five miniaturization. And speed here, it was 100 nanometers, and here it's 18 nanoseconds factor of five. So uh, not much progress, but the reason is very simple because here spin wave propagates eight millimeters, but it is faster because it's very sick heat. Here it's nanostructure. Everything is getting slower unless you will switch to exchange phase again. Um, but distance is also much smaller. It has to propagate few micron instead of millimeters. Therefore we are just slightly better in speed 
but we're still working in the same gigahertz frequency range so we do not go to terahertz or so that it's uh, a sub terahertz that is getting faster but let us have a look what happened with CMOS over this time CMOS energy consumption when we were published this paper it just took this value from some roadmap 100 at a joule now Soren says it's 35 so factor of three minimal size again it was 40 nanometer from wiki you can find now it's seven nanometers factor of two speed i couldn't get really data because it all depends on unit so i would say still taking into account that clock rate usually is limited and by three gigahertz i would say that speed they also do not have much progress here um, of course our progress is much more impressive but we started with very just a brutal prototype <laughs> Uh, they started already with a super technology which was developing for 50 years but still you see that CMOS is uh, developing and developing fast therefore the next question is of course what is the future if you will ask the question is this good for magnonics I will answer you definitely yes because I have seen so many so-called beyond CMOS technologies which work in a Hertz regime or consume hundreds of milliamps current or whatever uh, that the fact that magnonics has proven that it can have the same energy consumption and uh, footprint it's already a fantastic achievement it really proves that magnonics has a bright future if but if you will ask me is it sufficient is it enough to wake up people in intel that they start thinking to build magnet computer i will tell you not yet because you understand how much money i invested in all this technology how much time and so on everything works perfect uh, they will not start i think it's not yet good enough to uh, that they will start real industrialization of this research direction uh, therefore we are coming to the last question of this talk so what is the future and here i would like to tell you that the main message is that nanomagnonics is already here this is the most important message of the talk stay below 300 nanometers and you will get rid of most of the troubles which magnonics have use here exchange waves and you will forget also about damping and in this case of course nanomagnonics will be very competitive to plasmonics acoustics to in many cases i believe also even to photonics therefore i think uh, nanomagnonics has a very bright future but if to speak about data processing still binary data all magnon approach we have shown one way but this is just first or uh, second step yeah uh, you still have all this possible non bunch of nonlinear phenomena think what you need how you can fabricate it i think you can go on here emi cell based so um, magnet electric cells this converter based approach of course here i put some logos doesn't mean that these are all people who are pushing these directions but this means that um, these are people who I simply know by contact from IMAC to Delft to Kaiserslautern and they are building these converters and this is also very perspective direction and we shouldn't forget about terahertz all the studies were done at frequency of few gigahertz since it's easier but we do not forget that even for yttrium iron garnet the first brilliant zone is eight terahertz if you work to cobalt iron born or any other magnetic material it's hundreds terahertz and the shorter your wavelength, the higher you are in frequency, the faster you can process data, and so on and so on. So all future terahertz magnonic is just uh, uh, unstarted field of research with a huge, huge potential. Nowadays, neuromorphic computing is very important. And uh, many people are interested in this. And also Philip Pure and Kaiser Slautern, he was thinking about this task several years. And he said that he knows the way how to build neuromorphic computing properly properly i name it hardware based you know how our brain works uh, it changes its architecture based on the information processed information stored and this is the most complicated so you need to find a way to change your design your circuit based on spin waves themselves and philip says that he knows the way and I don't know the way, and I'm just looking forward. I wish him the best luck because if he will manage to do this, to realize that, uh, that will be, of course, breakthrough. Because then spin waves will, can be used in, uh, for real, much more powerful neuromorphic computing. So, next research direction is uh, inverse design magnonics. 
also it's a very very beginning very interesting and uh, so dr chu wang is leading this research direction in our group and it has a uh, direct relation to neuromorphic computing but approach is completely different we do not do anything neuromorphic within spin wave system instead we are using some external computer uh, which does some algorithm i don't know machine learning or any uh, other approaches uh, and tells us of which hardware we have to buy uh, we have to build in the magnetic system and this is very interesting still this approach is very powerful because if to do it properly then any data processing unit can be designed by smart computer and you just have to realize it and that means that most of the work in this task should be done by computer and it was a great luck that when i joined university of vienna here was a group is already a group of uh, Dieter Zeus, who is one of the uh, very well known people in uh, micromagnetic simulations and in different kind of algorithm optimization and now we are combining our efforts in order to try how it works and finally of course we do not forget about fancy quantum physics uh, the point is that yeah as soon as you will go down in temperature to 10 millikelvin you will get rid of um, uh, thermal magnons, you can get single magnons, you can think about entangled magnons, you can think about hybrid systems and so on. And uh, uh, the great luck is uh, Dr. Sebastian Knauer joined our team and uh, he is expert in quantum optics, quantum electronics and hybrid systems. And uh, now we are waiting for cryostat. I don't know when we will report on the first results, but what I can tell you for sure, this research direction is indeed very, very challenging. So let us see. And it's time to come to conclusions. So I will give you just two messages. The first message, which I try to bring through the whole uh, talk, is nanomagnonics is here. Nanomagnonics, I have shown you why, when you go to 100 nanometer scale in lateral dimensions, why everything is getting better. Uh, you really start working with completely new magnonics, and it's already established, and it really shows that all advantages which we are have expected are already here. And second message, I was thinking a long time how to formulate it, and then I just said it like this. Spin waves can be used for all possible times of computing, because I have shown you a few examples of binary data. Binary data is good, particularly for benchmarking. You can um, compare that what you do with CMOS, but at the same time, if you take all this huge amount of information which SpinWare carries and they say, OK, I need only your face or I need only your amplitude, you lose all this. So binary data, it's not really the proper way to go for um, uh, spin waves because it's spin waves is much can be much more efficient. That's why probably unconventional computing here would be of, uh, of very large interest. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.